Gregor the Overlander, Chapter 7. The darkness pressed down on Gregor's eyes until he felt it had physical weight, like water. He'd never been completely without light before. At home, street lights, car lights, and the occasional flashing fire truck shone in the tiny window of his bedroom. Here, once he'd blown out the oil lamp, it was as if he had lost the sense of sight entirely. He'd been tem tempted to relight the lamp. Merith had told him that torches burned all night in the corridor outside his room, and he could rekindle the flame there. But he wanted to save the oil. He'd be lost without it once he got out of regalia. Boots made a sniffling sound and, ta and pressed her back deeper into his side. His arm tightened around her. Servants had prepared separate beds for them, but Boots had climbed right in with Gregor. It hadn't been hard to get the underlanders to excuse them for bed. Everyone could see Boots could barely keep her eyes open, and he must have looked pretty ragged himself. He wasn't. Adrenaline was pumping through him so fast he was afraid that people could hear his heart beating through the heavy curtains that shut off their bedroom from the hall. The last thing he wanted to do was sleep. They had been invited to bathe again before bed. It was something of a necessity for Boots, who, in addition to stew, had conditioned her curls with some kind of pudding. Gregor hadn't objected either. The water gave him a quiet place to think out his escape plan. It also gave him a chance to ask Dulcet about the water system in the palace which out see without seeming suspicious. How do you guys have hot and cold running water? He asked. She told him the water was pumped from a series of hot and cold springs. And then it just empties back into the spring? He asked innocently. Oh no, that would not be fresh, said Dulcet. The dirty water falls into the river beneath the palace and then flows to the waterway. It was just the information he needed. The river beneath the palace was their way out. Even better, it led to the waterway. He didn't know what that was exactly, but Vicus had mentioned it had two gateways to the overland. Boots stirred again in her sleep and Gregor patted her side to quiet her. She had not seemed to miss home until bedtime, but she looked worried when he told her it was time to go to sleep. Mama, she asked. Lise? It was only that moment that Lizzie had written off to camp on the bus. It was, on, was it only that morning that Lizzie had written off to camp on the bus? It seemed like a thousand years ago. Home, Mama? insisted Boots. Even though she was exhausted, he had a hard time getting her to sleep. Now he could tell by how restless she was that she was having vivid dreams, probably full of cockroaches and bats, he thought. He had no way to tell how much time had passed, an hour, two, but what little noise he'd been able to hear through the curtain had ceased. If he was going to do this thing, he needed to get started. Gregor gently detached himself from Boots and stood up. He fumbled in the dark and found the sling Dulce had given him. Trying to position Boots inside it proved tricky. Finally, he just squeezed his eyes shut and let his other senses work. That was easier. He slid her in and slung the pack on his back. Boots murmured, Mama, and then her head, head fell against his shoulder. I'm working on it, baby, he whispered back and searched the table for the lamp. That was all he was taking. Boots, the pack, and the lamp. He need his hands for other things. Gregor groped his way to the curtain and pushed the edge aside. There was enough torchlight from the far hall for him to make out that the passage was empty. The underlanders had not bothered to post guards at his door now that they knew him better. They were making an effort to make him feel like a guest. And anyway, where would he go? Down the river, he thought grimly, wherever that leads. He crept along the hall, taking care to place each of his feet, bare feet, silently. Thankfully, Boots slept on. His plan would disintegrate if she woke before he got out of the palace. Their bedroom was conveniently close to the bathroom, and Gregor followed his way to the watery sound. His plan was simple. The river ran under the palace. If he could wake his, make his way to the ground floor without losing the sound of water, he would find the place that it drained into the river. If the plan was simple, 
its execution was not. It took Gregor several hours to weave his way down through the palace. The bathrooms were not always near the stairs, and he found himself having to backtrack so he wouldn't lose the sound of rushing water. Twice he had to duck into rooms and hide when he spotted underlanders. There weren't many about, but some sort of guards patrolled the palace at night. Finally, the sound of water became stronger, and he made his way to the lowest level of the building. He followed his ears to where the roar was loudest and sneaked through a doorway. For a moment, Gregor almost abandoned his plan. When Dulcet had said river, he had pictured the rivers that flowed through New York City. But this underland river looked like something out of an action-adventure movie. It wasn't terribly wide, but it ran with such speed that the surface was churned into white foam. He couldn't guess its depth, but had it, it had enough power to carry large boulders by, as if they were empty soda cans. No wonder the Underlanders didn't bother to post a guard on the dock. The river was more dangerous than any army could assemb they could assemble. But you must be able to travel on it. They have boats, thought Gregor, noticing half a dozen crafts tied up along the rush of the current. They were made out of some kind of skin stretched over a frame. They reminded him of the canoes at camp. Camp? Why couldn't he just be at camp like a normal kid? Trying not to think of the bobbing boulders, he lit his oil lamp from a torch by the dock. On reflection, he took the torch as well. Where he was going, light would be as important as air. He blew out the oil lamp to save fuel. He carefully climbed into one of the boats and checked it out. The torch slid into a holder clearly designed for it. How do you get this thing down in the water, he wondered. Two ropes held it aloft. They were attached to a metal wheel that was affixed to the dock. Well, here goes nothing, Gregor said, and gave the wheel a yank. It gave a loud creak, and the boat fell straight into the river, knocking Gregor on his rear end. The current swept up the boat like it was a dried leaf. Gregor gasped, grasped the sides and hung on as they shot into the darkness. Hearing voices, he managed to look back at the dock for a moment. Two underlanders were screaming something after him. The river curved, and they vanished from sight. Would they come after him? Of course they'd come after him. But he had a head start. How far was it to the waterway? What was the waterway? And once he got there, where did he go next? Gregor would have been more concerned about these questions if he wasn't trying so hard to stay alive. Along with the boulders, he had to dodge the jagged black rocks that jutted out of the water. He found an oar lying along the bottom of the boat, and he used it to deflect the canoe off the rocks. The temperature of the underland had felt comfortably cool since he'd arrived, especially after the 90-degree heat of his apartment. But the cold wind whipping up off the water made goosebumps rise on his flesh. Gregor! He thought he heard someone calling his name. Was it him, his imagination, or... No, there it was again. The underlanders must be closing in on him. The river swerved, and suddenly he could see a little better. A long cavern lined with crystals shimmered along around him, reflecting back his torchlight. Gregor made out a glittering beach flanking one side of the river up ahead. A tunnel led from the beach into the dark. On impulse, Gregor pushed off a rock and pointed the canoe toward the beach. He paddled desperately with the oar for the shore. Staying on the river was no use. The underlanders were breathing down his neck. Maybe he had time to pull up on the beach and hide in the tunnel. After they'd passed by, he could wait a few hours and try the river again. The canoe slammed into the beach. Gregor caught himself just before his face hit the bottom of the boat. Boots jerked partly awake and cried a little but he soothed her back to sleep with his voice as he struggled to pull his craft against, across the sand with one hand while carrying the torch with the other. It's okay, Boots. Shh, go back to sleep. Hi, Bat, she murmured, and her head plopped back on his shoulder. Gregor heard his name in the distance and sped up. He had just reached the mouth of the tunnel when he ran headfirst into something warm and furry. Startled, he staggered back a few places, paces dropping the torch. 
the something stepped out into the dim light. Gregor's knees turned to jelly, and he sank to the sand. The face of a monstrous rat broke into a smile. <laughs>